the largest and hottest library of 16-bit games. Part of what made the Genesis so successful in the U.S. is the insane amount of localized games. If Sega fans only played games made in North America, all we'd have is stuff like Vector Man, Toe Jam, sports games, and whatever else they make in the West. I like Genesis, and it costs a lot less. We kid, that game I'll there. take Sonic and Genesis. <laughs> Japan brought us Sonic, Fantasy Star, Streets of Rage, Gunstar Heroes, Shinobi, Shining Force, Lunar, Popful Male, They, Street Fighter, I could go on. You see that new move? Oh, oh, that was bad. Yeah, some talented Westerners also made some quality software, but without localizing Japan's games, this library would be weak. Introducing Castlevania Bloodlines for Sega Genesis, the most horrifying vampire hunt ever. Konami is one of the best third parties in terms of localizing Genesis games. We got Castlevania Bloodlines, Contra, friggin' TMNT Hyperstone Heist, Rocket Knight, Zombies Ate My Neighbors, and even Tiny Toon Adventures. The animation gives you a real cartoon feel. The competing Super Nintendo had a stronghold on Konami's Gradius series, hailed as a Penguin classic in the shmup genre. This horizontal scrolling shooter has this well thought out power up bar. For each red capsule you collect, the next box gets highlighted. Press the power up button to activate it. They can speed up your ship, improve your shot, drop missiles, give you a shield. It's a nice layer of depth to innovate the familiar spaceship shooter game design. Alright, then they made this thing called Parodius, a parody of Gradius. Get it? So, same thing, but now you can play as a penguin or octopus. All the bad guys are crazy things like Easter Island heads, other penguins, ladies, cat submarines, dancing pandas, whatever the hell this thing is. In addition to the aforementioned power-up bar, you can also get bells. They're originally from Twinbee. These change color when you shoot them. Gold just gives you points, but the other colors are a unique superpower, like screen clearing bombs, laser walls, corpulence, megaphones, it's wild. Like a Japanese game show on bath salts. The year is 1995. Even though Konami is pretty good about localizing its other popular games, Parodius never touched North America. It's out there. Sega Saturn has its surprise launch at E3. And while the six release games are an alright starting gun, the lineup Americans can look forward to looks fantastic. In this E3 video from Tronix, Parodius is on the list, slated for its first Western release ever. But like many titles proudly promised to the American Saturn, Herodias did not fly with the bald eagles. Shmups, shoot 'em ups, spaceship shooters, STGs, dodgy dodgy don't get hit 'em ups, whatever you want to call them. They've been around for a while. For much of the 80s, they were prominent in both the arcades and at home. It's fun! Whether you're cruising through the electric streets of Nippon or hitting up video joints in Western worlds, spaceships will be flying and bullets will get dodged. In the cabinets, on your cartridges. And in this genre, Gradius is a household name. But realistic? Give me a break. Konami brought their classic to the West many times. The Super Nintendo launched with Gradius 3 in North America, notorious for being harder than diamonds. Across the world, it's welcomed with warm reviews and millions of sales. Parodius, on the other hand, barely made it out of Japan at all. None of the three installments ever got localized to North America. They also never touched a Sega platform. That's about to change. 
There exist three Parodii at this point in 1994. The trilogy starts with Parodius, released on the MSX in 1988. This seems to be inspired by interchangeable features, unlocked with the two cartridge slot MSX machines. For example, if you played Nemesis with Penguin Adventure in the second cartridge slot, you could blast away through space as a flying Penta Penguin. Its resemblance to Parodius, released later that decade, is striking. The roughly six-stage shooter lets you play as one of four then-popular Konami characters, along with Taco the Octopus. He's the main character, sometimes called Mr. Parodius. The MSX manual was loosely translated to English back in 2002, revealing a plot. But the translation is kinda sketchy. From what I gathered here, children like computer games more than their parents, and the parents are toiling away at daily life, all while World War III seems to be right around the corner. So Taco sets out to spread peace and hope as the dream programmer, planting the seedlings of peace. But suddenly, the sworn enemy bug comes to mess things up, like a computer bug or something. Taco stood up. Even an octopus stands up. Eight legs afford well balance. He sets out with four of his friends to defeat the bug. Not that bug. While each character looks unique and has their own power-up sprites, their attacks are virtually the same. There's no real advantage to playing one character over another. You do battle with hordes of Easter Island heads, penguins, and even Heno Heno Mohiji themselves. Each power-up makes your bar advance one unit, letting you select which power-up you want at your leisure, just like in Gradius. But be careful not to use the power-up that gets rid of all your power-ups. This first installment is pretty basic, taking heavy level design influence from Gradius. It's also dummy hard. No easy mode here, just an even harder mode. Each stage starts in space, with mostly recurring enemy patterns to get your ship beefed up. Then you fly through the theme of the stage, usually with a floor and ceiling. They often have a mid-boss, and always end with a boss boss. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but FUN, fun fact. FACT! You can play it on your Saturn with the Konami MSX Antiques Collection, released only to Japan in 1997. No, it does not have Metal Gear. Parodius Da is the sequel, released to the arcades in 1990. It's a little more celebrated than the MSX OG, now featuring TV advertisements. Da pumped out several ports, the most of any Parodius installment becoming the first to release in Europe. Parodius Da pretty much translates to It's Parodius, but in Europe they just called it Parodius, unless it's called Parodius Nonsense Fantasy. It has four characters instead of five, but unlike the MSX game, each do have their own unique power-ups. For example, Twinbee has the boxing gloves from its original vertical game, adapted to this horizontal shooter. Da has a whopping 10 stages. Like the original, they all start in space with recurring enemies, the same lines of Easter Island heads to get some SICK THICK gear. A neat stylistic change is each character has its own theme music for the opening space area. Right away, you can see the improved 16-bit color range. This gives off a more vibrant and bright explosion of cartoon sprites and bubbly backgrounds. Your enemies are vicious onslaughts of tripping penguins, sumo wrestlers, chicks, and chicks. Oh! Da is pretty hard, but more forgiving than its predecessor. Still, it's filled with cheap shots. It starts out easy enough with this welcoming sea of green, introducing you to the well-known flying cat face pirate ship mid-boss. Shoot its cat face to deal catastrophical damage. <gasps> Stage 2's mid-boss is when your brain hits the gym, firmly placing your neck under the high heels of this lady, Chichibinta Rika. The only way to survive is by flying under her legs until she goes away, changing directions when she shakes her hips. <laughs> this is where most new players will start getting killed, ending Da's honeymoon phase. 
The rest of these eight stages are tough obstacle courses, filled with many cheap shots that absolutely will kill you at first encounter. The only way to learn them is by dying, starting over from designated checkpoints. On the default normal difficulty, you aren't given power-ups on respawn, leaving you with the default speed and single shot until you find more items. This makes some bosses next to impossible to fight upon respawn, rendering you too slow to dodge its attacks. Because of this, I'm recommending a video game sin. Turn the difficulty down from normal. Pretty weedy. Feel free to roast me. Call me a wuss, a pathetic poser who cheated not only the game, but himself. Parodius Da is a little too hard to start on normal. I've played, beaten, and one credit cleared many a shmup in my day. Don't feel like you must play through Parodius Da on default settings. It does have adaptive difficulty, so the more power-ups you get, the harder it will be, regardless of how you set it up. But like any shooter, you can get used to difficult sections, building up your skill to the point of slicing through like a sumo's lethal undergarments. Stage 3 is when Konami really spit roasts you. Midway through, you have to blast your way through walls of dots all while contending with enemies. Slamming into those dots will kill you instantly, like any solid object. You really get to know your hitbox here. Another layer is added in the second half, forcing you to speed through a maze with more enemies and dot walls. There are dead ends. This can take some time to figure out. The rest of the stages don't mess with you this much, but there are underwater sections in stage 8. Going under slows your ship down, making it harder to dodge stuff. Fun fact! The arcade game uses the same hardware as Konami's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Turtles in Time. Bring that statue back, you bloated beanbag! They repurposed the same 16-bit board for several games, including Parodius Da. Once you set the game's difficulty to your liking, it becomes legitimately fun. With Limitless Continues, you can keep playing and playing to explore the goofy levels and learn its toughest boss fights. Eventually, you get used to Da's bullcrap and get good enough to breeze through with few or one credit. The soundtrack almost entirely consists of remixed classical songs. It fits the splatter of random cartoon insanity very well, really completing the Parodius experience. One interesting new addition is Auto Mode. This selects power-ups for you in a designated order. I did not interview the Japanese developers, but someone else did. Gamist sat down with four Parodius team members in 1994. Shmupilations graciously translated it to English for the general public. We had the auto option in Parodius Da, and I think that was a period where the appeal of STGs was expanding to include a wider user base. As such, the auto mode was intentionally added for those new players. This interview mainly focuses on Gokujo Parodius, the third game in this Gradius parody trilogy. Gokujo is when the series makes a mark in the 32-bit universe, one of the first to use the Konami GX board. Game design is also showing its true colors. This has 8 stages instead of the 10 from Da. But the layouts, level ideas, and design decisions are much more elaborate. Tokuda Tsukasa told Gamist, he was the team leader for Parodius Da, and did a couple of its ports. He's the main planner for Gokujo Parodius. He said it had been a while since he worked on arcade games. While walking through his local game centers in the early 90s, he noticed a massive trend change. I noticed there was nothing but versus fighting games. I personally loved STGs like Gradius, but you could barely find even a single Hori STG. Well, I thought if no one else is making these, I'll just have to do it myself. The two genres might seem different, but they do share one major parallel. Gameplay is all about how much space you control. 
An experienced Street Fighter player knows what move their main has, where the hitboxes will land, and how fast each attack comes out. The more space you control, the better off you are. Shmups are also about dominating space. Not outer space necessarily, but like the space around you. You never want to get cornered, and must leave enough room to dodge bullets from all angles. With each bullet cloud, you must, in a split second, negotiate your flight path without losing too much space. Selecting which enemies you destroy will reward you with more space. Not only are you assuming the role of a spaceship pilot, you are also a real estate mogul. Tsukasa did not want to make another standard shooter like the ones that dominated the 80s. Given the exploding popularity of fighters, he felt they could take some inspiration from them. I was thinking about having six characters at first, but when I showed it to my boss, he said, fighting games have a lot of characters, so why don't we make it eight? Here they are, the characters from Da, and four new ones. You could say there's actually 16 characters, since each have a Player 2 variant. An Echo Fighter, if you want to call it that. Like Da, they all have unique power-ups. Much like fighters, each character has their own advantage. They all start with the standard single pea shooter. While weak, it's usually powerful enough to kill bosses. Most of them have a shoot here weak point that only takes a dozen or so hits. Koitsu, a fun stick man flying on a paper plane, has a really wide shot when powered up. This makes it much easier for him to cut through the walls of cheese in stage 3, and shoot at enemies from above and below. Hikaru's powered shots are more concentrated, so she has a more difficult time navigating cheese, but can more easily cut through Mermaid Lady's laughter. Her strawberries make for a nice narrow beam. Koitsu, on the other hand, struggles to slice up this villainous joy. Fun fact! fact. Koitsu has his very own Yu-Gi-Oh card. They all have some kind of shield or barrier obtained later on the power gauge. Some only block your front, while others go all around. Koitsu's barrier looks like this. Shuzilo Ha is credited as the designer. For Koitsu's barrier, I had originally drawn this whole design with flames but I was abruptly told to change that. Whoever made you do such a thing? It was you, Sukasa. Draw this. No way, I never said that. Yes, you did. Make it look like rubber. <laughs> I said make the sound effect have like a pop sound, but that's because that barrier is really just a bell. A soft, transparent bell. We get Twinby, whose boomerang boxing gloves still rip apart every soul in its path. Of course, Vic Viper is here for the traditionalists. Choosing Vic is like going to an elaborate ice cream shop with like 20 wild and out there flavors, but you wind up choosing vanilla. You could have had a flying octopus. Taco, or Mr. Parodius, he just had to come back. You can't have Parodius without him. Pentaru returns, and his powered up shot is nuts. Probably has the most narrow beam, with the impact of missiles easily tearing through enemies. Michael the Flying Pig has the widest spread. Mambo's also pretty cool. Take that, Darius. Now I am the space fish. When I talked with people at Konami who knew a lot about our older games, that name kept coming up. I wanted those people to see the Mambo character and think, oh, it's Space Manbo. For Akane-chan and Hikaru-chan, they were added to make those folks happy. You know who I'm talking about. I think Gokujo does a better job at giving each level its own environmental gimmick. Stage 1 sends you through a claw machine. Flying through these falling toys requires correct timing. Now since you can see the toy's drop tube, you know just where they're going to fall. Stage 2 has an underwater section and brings back the cat ship, but this time, it's a cat sub. Fortunately, going underwater does not slow you down this time, but it does impact Koitsu's paratrooper buddies. They don't have good scuba gear, so they swim to the surface and float in these little tubes.
I also got a lot of contradictory instructions when I was designing the Stage 2 boss, Eliza. Make her look like a vivacious young girl in the bloom of youth. And, actually, it'll be better if you make her a little older. In the end, it was more like, well, this is what I can draw. Eliza has one of the few cheap shots in this version of Parodius, flapping her mermaid tail at you. It covers half the screen. This will probably kill you at first. That cheese wall in stage 3 is really where the difficulty goes boom, similar to Da. Even the developers have a hard time with it. After Gokujo Parodius was released, we all went out drinking as a team, and on the way back, we stopped by the game center. Tsukasa sat down to play the game he himself had created, and we all watched intently, and stage 3 is where he died. Its boss is, um, a laser-equipped pastry chef? You kill it by shooting at the little buddies inside its mouth. Its formal name is Decoration Core, parody of Big Core from Gradius. Well, this might be a good time to bring up the Maui Battleship. It's a separate stage that appears at random. You could get it after stage 2, stage 6, whenever. A complete playthrough is guaranteed to encounter it once. The Moai battleship was supposed to be the Moai from Parodius Da taking revenge, so I thought it would be more fitting and interesting if, rather than having the Moais be fixed in place, their position changed each time you played. <laughs> It's a tough nut to crack. You have to survive as it moves in from behind, launching swarms from not the direction you're able to shoot at. For this reason, any character with only forward-facing shots have a difficult time with Maui. You're pretty much going to lose a lot of credits here when you first play Goku Joe. And once you do lose a credit and hit continue, you'll start at the next stage. So, the Maui battleship has to be done in one credit. Stage 4 takes you through a flying chicken infested construction zone. The speed at which you move through it increases. Its boss, Crazy Core, is this. When I was drawing the stage 4 boss, Crazy Core, I thought to myself, it looks like if you pushed him from the side, he'd just topple over. Sukasa thought the same. My original concept for Crazy Core was something featuring traffic lights, but as I designed him, it gradually turned into something absurd and unrecognizable. Stage 5 is all in space, mainly featuring enemies from Gradius and other games. This is when we really start to see Parodius make fun of non-Konami shmups. You can see these spinning metal squares, like the ones from Xevious. Some of these bad guys appear to reference Galaga. Another thing is Michael's green shield. It looks just like the arm in Darius. It even shrinks when it takes damage. The most fun thing to design was probably the Stage 5 boss. Capsule Monster Cappuccino fires power-up items at you. Be careful, spike balls are sometimes mixed into the stream, and they'll kill you. Like in Da, Gokujo has adaptive difficulty, so the more powers you have, the more iron balls you must contend with. Like stock markets, Stage 6 takes you to the moon. There exists an East Asian folktale, suggesting a rabbit pounding rice cake can be seen on the lunar surface. Here, we get to fly through the lunar rice cake factory. Sorry, Wallace, it ain't cheese. You must navigate around giant swinging hammers while weaving through thick fields of bullets. Its boss is Princess Cayuga, an ancient folklore character who comes from the moon. Turns out, she's just a cardboard cutout, with penguins voicing her through a boombox. Stage 7 is a disco boogie wonderland. It's insanely tough, sending you through tight corridors packed with Konami's most fierce penguin army. Before you get to the final boss, you must face an old nemesis.
that sensual Vegas hip shaker returns from Parodius Da, literally tearing up the dance floor. But this mid-boss is more difficult than the penultimate boss, Taco's Cutie, a giant royal octopus. How dare you oppose me? I've been able to kill her by just staying in one spot. She might be the game's easiest boss. Perhaps that's part of the joke. The minor plotline of Gokujo revolves around the characters going on a quest for their past glory. The full title of the game translates to Fantastic Parodius, Pursuing the Former Glory. It's also Konami's team, searching for the past glory of shooting games. I'd like to see more arcade games that respect and value their older, longtime fans. That was something we had in mind with Gokujo Parodius, and its subtitle, Pursue the Glory of the Past, has that nuance as well. Back in the day, I used to go to the game center, and there were all these different games to play. But nowadays, it's nothing but versus fighting games, and there's no place for players like me. So you get to the end, and at long last, you find Mr. Past Glory. Hey there, I'm Mr. Past Glory. That's all, folks. It's a comically grim outlook from the developers. There's an extra stage after the ending. It's a highly difficult and long celebration of Konami games. You must beat it in one credit too. Starting a new credit sends you back to the start of the stage instead of a checkpoint. In the Saturn port, you can unlock it after beating the game and play this stage from the main menu. Since they went to the trouble of spending their money on our game, the least we could do is say thank you. After all, I want players to walk away with good feelings when it's all done. Maybe this way they'll feel good and want to play it again, after having endured so much abuse. I personally think Gokujo Parodius is a near-perfect follow-up to the previous two games. Every level is based on clever ideas without getting repetitive. On top of having a funny cast of characters and enemies, the attack patterns and boss fights seem fair save for a few cheap shots. Unlike Da, this is not tougher than Dolomite, accessible to beginners. Expert shmup masters still face a fun challenge thanks to its adaptive difficulty. A good game to try to 1cc. These remixes of classical songs are cheery, and all seem to fit perfectly with the bright, bubbly, colorful fever dream. It is at this point in the Parodius franchise when Konami perfected this formula, managing to create two equally awesome entries later on. Parodius Da is still a great game, but I think Gokujo is better. Funnily enough, Tsukasa disagrees. How would I personally rate Gokujo Parodius? Well, I would say it's somewhere around 50 out of 100. The previous Parodius Da was more like 80 out of 100 for me. Gokujo Parodius is said to have hit arcades in April 1994. Like Da, this too has multiple console ports. It came to Super Famicom in November of that year. It features three more characters and lots of hardware slowdown. The next month, December 3rd, 1994, the Parodius Deluxe Pack launched with Sony's breakthrough home console in Japan. This compilation has near-perfect arcade ports of Parodius Da and Gokujo Parodius. It does have some slowdown in certain areas. One other issue is it pauses for loading times in between levels. The arcade game seamlessly moves through like butter. Later that month, Japan's Sega Saturn magazine confirmed this Parodius package is coming to Saturn. A translated quote from Konami in this article roughly reads, quote, The Saturn version will be a complete and perfect port, including that exhilarating feeling. Sega nerds on Usenet are excited about this port, saying this will let them compare 2D capabilities of the Saturn and PlayStation, 
Nick Rocks imported the PlayStation game for February's issue of Game Fan. His review starts by saying he's part of a dying or already dead breed of shooting game fans. Like Japan, shooting games once filled the arcades and consoles of the West, now fading away. Are there any shooter fans left? According to American companies, the answer seems to be no. Rox does praise the two games in this deluxe pack, but says the visuals could be done on a Super Nintendo. Funnily enough, this is not totally inaccurate. He recommends it to shooter fans, but does not suggest anyone buy the console for this game. Throughout April of 1995, parodious talks are still buzzing on Usenet boards. The United Kingdom's Edge magazine says the Saturn port is due out in Japan sometime in May. It's leaving many fans wondering if Sega of America will pick it up for the niche shoot 'em up fanbase. E3 rolled around on May 11th, unleashing a flurry of news for both Parodius and Saturn fans. Of course, the Sega Saturn had its surprise North American launch on this day shocking many. Not only that, but the console's fabled Parodius port is on the show floor. E3 visitors are getting a chance to play the Japanese version on Saturn before it comes out in any region. People who wound up playing both ports slammed their keyboards to tell the world Saturn's Parodius runs better than PlayStation's with significantly less slowdown. This early sign at 2D prowess is great news for Sega fans. On top of this, Konami announced at E3, Parodius is getting localized to North America for both consoles. It's listed here in the Tronix E3 vid, right next to Castlevania. Can't wait for that localized Castlevania game for my Sega Saturn. Ha! <laughs> That'll be fun! Footage of Saturn's Parodius in action at the show is said to be in Marty Chin's E3 video. Still, no sign of it being preserved online all these years later. Hopefully it comes to light someday. Marty Chin, I hope you're out there. On May 19th, Gokujo Parodius Da Deluxe Pack came out for the Saturn in Japan. If you look at the game's files, you will find kaihatsu.doc. This contains messages from the development team. The file was taken out of the European release, but stayed in the PSP port for some reason, according to the cutting room floor. After putting it through some rough online translators, H. Spark Ueda said the complex graphical tricks on the Konami GX board work seamlessly on Saturn. He calls the console hardware very deep, saying he worked to get as much power out of that hardware as he could, but says there are a lot of parts he hasn't used yet. Ueda apologizes for the slowdown when Cat Submarine turns and during the Rika sequence. Most of these other messages are small stories, not going super deep into the intricacies of developing this port. Sound designer Osamu Kasai says something along the lines of, quote, Well, it's finally over. Why am I so tired? At any rate, now I can drink. Now I can go to Disneyland with my daughter. And now I can sleep. TCRF is looking for a fluent Japanese speaker to translate this hidden text. So if you're up for the task, I'm sure they would appreciate you dearly. For its August issue, GameFan imported Saturn's Parodius from Japan. K. Lee gushed over how much better this is than on PlayStation, with next to no slowdown and no loading pauses. They're calling it a truly arcade-perfect conversion. It's also a nice early example of transparent sprites being possible on Saturn, seen here in the fight against Eliza. Other common game players on Usenet are also importing Japan's Parodius, getting it early before Konami sends it stateside. Throughout fall, there's a growing discussion on Usenet about the control Sega of Japan has on what Saturn games get released in other regions. It's talking about total control over what gets localized, and even what games Western developers are allowed to make. Sam Pettis, known better as The Scribe, wrote all about this control in his book. Both he and the Usenet dwellers spoke about Eternal Champions, developed by a Sega of America team. The 2D fighter came to both the Genesis and Sega CD, met with outstanding praise. A third Saturn installment was in the works and had a lot of hype, 
but according to the scribe, SOJ axed the project in fear it would outperform Virtua Fighter. SOJ wanted its own to be the definitive fighter on Saturn, not the American-made Eternal Champions. They would enforce control in other ways, even going as far as demanding what Saturn launch games would be made in America, not allowing the bug team to make a Sonic game midway through development, insisting the console launch early despite Tom Kalinske's wishes, and even refusing SOA the ability to work with three different developers on hardware, all of whom would later go on to create competing consoles. SOA's then-president Tom Kalinske spoke about it all in our most recent interview. Well, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a criteria. We were given, we were told what we, were, what we could have and uh, in large part, and so we didn't have a choice. I mean, we didn't need, obviously, we didn't even have Sonic, for God's sake, initially. And that was a, a huge, huge mistake. And we didn't have FIFA soccer, and we didn't have uh, Joe Montana football. That wasn't our decision. So that all come from Japan? Or like, did they tell you, hey, produce this software, don't produce this software? Is that basically what, what basically, that was like? Basically, that's what happened, yeah. Kalinsky was allowed to do whatever he wanted with the Genesis, making it a viable threat against Nintendo in the US. But in the era of Saturn, his reins were taken away. The early discussions about this control from Sega of Japan sparked reasonable concerns about what the North American Saturn library will look like. What games will we get? Can we rely on Sega to localize the good Japanese titles? Will the Gen Wars and Black Fires of our world improve in quality? Well, one thing's for sure, Parodius is on the way. Later that year, Sega's Amy Cardwell posted multiple release lists showing Parodius is down for an October launch. While a handful of impatient shooter fans already imported the game, the many other sprite fans are ecstatic. In September, Layer Section came out in Japan to glowing reviews from American importers, showing the world the shooter genre may finally get a comeback. Before the end of the month, the localization of Parodius got cancelled. This post talks about a separate post in the Sony board, which is now banned. Thanks, Google. Someone there brought up rumors, claiming Sony and Sega are refusing to release the game in the West, some suggesting it's censorship. This person says they got in touch with some Sega reps, who said this is Konami's decision, not Sega's. They are not restricting Konami from releasing the game. That same day, Konami rep Christian Munoz posted a separate statement saying Konami decided not to release Parodius on Saturn this year. Quote, We might release Parodius in 1996. He says Konami will keep supporting Saturn with great games like Castlevania The Bloodletting. The statement from Munoz says Sega is not censoring Parodius, despite the rumors. But a few days later, this separate statement from Konami was posted to the news group. It reads, quote, Due to unforeseen circumstances, Parodius will not come out in 1995, but possibly next year. It doesn't clarify what those unforeseen circumstances are. A few days later in the previous rumor thread, Sega's associate director of third-party licensing, Kurt Busch, chimed in. He said, quote, All Saturn third-party games, including Parodius, are played and scored by testers, not some nefarious Sega censor. Bush went on to talk about how Sega's testers make sure they don't release games of substandard quality, seemingly hinting at a possibility that Parodius wasn't considered good enough. He ends with, quote, Konami has very graciously set the record straight. If you want conspiracies, you'll need to look at another news group. You'll never guess who jumped in the thread next. Victor Ireland of Working Designs, who at the time is finishing up the localization of Ironstorm. It's a World War II strategy game. He told the thread during the project, Sega of Japan asked him to remove Nazi symbols originally in the game. 
Vic wanted to leave the symbols in to keep Ironstorm historically accurate. Sega of America helped Vic convince SOJ to let the ESRB decide. So then SOJ backed off, allowing the swastikas to stay. Bush replied, backing up Vic's story. About a month later, in November 1995, a translated localized Parodius was released for the Sega Saturn in Europe. At around this time, tons of speculation on why it didn't come out in North America littered the internet. It's clearly not because the game isn't in English. The title screens, ending dialogue, and even the special megaphone weapon are in English. Eliza's laughter uses western letters, and she even says, oh no, when hit. <laughs> Gokujo Parodius is now called Parodius Fantastic Journey, and Da is just called Parodius. Sort of writing off the MSX game. A small amount of background text is still in Japanese, but this is the crazy wacky Japanese arcade game, so that can be forgiven. Some noted sexual themes as a potential deal-breaker, but the many innuendos are kept in Europe's Parodius. Things like Koitsu's condom shield, the ability to put breasts next to your name in Da's scoreboard, and Rika's giant shaking hips. Even the background of Gokujo's Stage 3 is left unchanged. Now if you look there, you can see the bananas in the tiles sort of resemble a certain shape that kinda looks a It's a dick. I'm gonna level with you here. That- that's a penis. Europe's age rating says it's okay for all ages, but this part of the world is generally less sensitive to sexual content than Americans. Still, even if it got slapped with a T or M rating, Parodius wouldn't come close to the mature content seen in Mortal Kombat and Phantasmagoria. I doubt it got cancelled for being overly Japanese or anime themed, since Sega of America had no problem localizing Vey, Lunar, and Popful Male, all with their fair share of mild sexual themes too. Remember, Sega is targeting older, mature gamers, so anything like this should really be a non-issue. We're not talking Nintendo here, but Europe's Parodius did alter some in-game content. There is one significant change in this localized game. This is Parodius Da's Stage 2 boss, Eagle Eagle Sabnosuke. He appears in the Las Vegas-themed stage. Right after the mini-boss with Rika, here in the Japanese original, he's a giant bald eagle, wearing a top hat and bow tie themed after the United States flag. When defeated, he loses his feathers and gets bug-eyed, falling off the screen. It's assumed this is a parody of Sam the Olympic Eagle, used by Konami to promote hypersports. According to the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, this iconic animal has been the U.S. national bird since 1782. The majestic creature is widely used as a symbol of American freedom. Under the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, taking the animal dead or alive can result in hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines, and even up to a couple years in prison. Eagle Eagle appears pretty early on in Parodius Da, and even shows up as a recurring small enemy in Gokujo. This means, when played on the E3 show floor, this bald eagle buddy likely showed up several times. For Europe's release, he's recolored to a green bird with a not-so-American hat. It would be strange to censor Eagle Eagle for Europe, since it's not the United States. The continent also got a localized version of Da for Super Nintendo, which does not recolor Eagle Eagle. Because of this, it would be reasonable to assume Europe's Parodius is the same version that would have been released in North America. Many fans assume Eagle Eagle is the reason why no Parodius game ever came out in North America, but to this day, there seems to be no hard evidence or documentation confirming this as a fact. It would be ironic, considering the country's decades-long battle over using Native American imagery as sports team mascots. I know online polls have a lot of room for error, but I did ask my American Twitter followers if this boss fight would offend them. Out of 40 votes, 87% said no. While that's a vast majority, there were a few who said yes. I asked around at home and at work and couldn't find a single live person who said they would be offended. Konami already recolored Eagle Eagle, presumably to not risk offending Americans. It seems, even today, very few people are actually bothered by it. 
Could a silly bird really cause the free world to cancel a video game? We may never truly know. We do know they did change its colors. I digress. Besides, Konami and Sega both dispelled censorship rumors. They set the record straight, putting all potential speculation to rest. But let's discuss the contradiction. I know the marketing stereotype is Americans love nothing more than big muscles, big guns, and cheeseburgers, but out of 266 million people, do you really expect all of them to have the same interests? We already know they don't when it comes to video games, thanks to the success of cutesy mascots and numerous Weeboo games Sega had no issue localizing before. They're popular among hardcore audiences and are in demand. Parodius is in demand, evidenced by several posts in magazines. Is it because of cutting edge, creamy 3D graphics? No, it's because Parodius is fun. A fan base is clamoring for this content to be localized, and they did it! Konami localized it! The game and inserts are in English, and it's out in Europe! Even if some conservative suits at E3 really got offended by Eagle Eagle, the bird got recolored. We can't trust Kurt Busch, and suggesting Parodius didn't meet quality standards is just a bunch of crap. If this isn't fun enough, explain this. If it doesn't look modern enough, explain this. Konami themselves said it's not due to censorship, but also mentions unforeseen circumstances. What are the unforeseen circumstances? It can't be SOA since they fought to keep swastikas. Is it really so niche that it can't be sold to Americans? Oh wait! Americans are already buying it! Stores on U.S. soil spent the next several months selling imports of Parodius to customers who would have instead bought localized copies. It's ready! Why not pull the trigger when all the laborious localization work is done? Why would Konami refuse to release it? If it did, perhaps it would look like this. You're looking at Saturn Dave's imagining of a North American Parodius copy. He acquired high-quality scans of the European inserts from Gabriel da Costa and worked his graphic design wizardry. For those unfamiliar with his work, he likes to make manuals, back covers, and disc art for Saturn games that never got released here. He does extremely high-quality stuff. It's like someone went to a parallel universe where it came out in the States, yoinked the copy, and handed it to me. It's beautiful. Thank you, Dave. So, as for why it never came out here, there's a few possibilities. My best guess is Sega of Japan put the kibosh on Parodius. We know they had total control over what got released in North America. It's also possible Konami, for some reason, decided it wasn't fit for the North Americans, but thought it could sell well in Europe. After all, it does already have brand recognition there, thanks to Parodius Da being localized. non weebu North Americans largely wouldn't know what this is, but the crazy Japanese insanity would certainly get people's attention. Video games have been marketed well here for being crazy Japanese games. The only other explanation is perhaps they had copyright issues with the soundtrack. But other Parodius ports changed songs when this problem came up. I think this answer is unlikely, since they didn't need to change the soundtrack for Europe. Now, if Sega of Japan said no, then why would they not localize it for the PlayStation? Perhaps Konami wouldn't want to release it on just one platform to sour its relationship with Sega. Maybe it was the other way around. One thing's for sure. Arcade shooter fans certainly love it. The British Sega Saturn magazine calls it a stunningly playable blaster of the old school. They say it's not a game you should buy a Saturn for, but they definitely recommend it to anyone who wants a great 2D game. They gave it a generous 87 out of 100. CD Consoles in France gave it decent marks, complimenting the wacky Japanese humor, saying it has some graphical benefits over the SNES games. They call it an excellent shmup for newbies, but say people who already have it on Super Nintendo should not pick this up. Big thanks to Shiro Podcast bro Peter Malik for reading this for me. He speaks French. Maximum gives it a brief write-up, straight up saying they're not surprised to see Konami's first Saturn game be a Parodius port. Perhaps these UK writers are used to seeing Parodius. It criticizes Deluxe Pack for being a 16-bit game, partially inaccurate, since one of the two games here is 32-bit. Mean Machines says this franchise shakes the foundations of run-of-the-mill blaster clones, maintaining smart level design and great action. They scored it a whopping 90 out of 100. Meanwhile, in the US, people are still asking for Parodius. Early 1996 release lists on Usenet show it to be in a state of limbo. 
By mid-year, Konami's release lists don't show Parodius, but they do show some good news. North American Saturn fans will soon get Police Knots and Suikoden. Fans online kept asking for Parodius as late as October of 1996. One post from November of that year complains about Konami not appealing to the widespread anime nerd fanbase and are instead focusing on sports games for the North American Saturn. By the end of 96, stores began importing Japanese copies of Sexy Parodius, the fifth installment. They're seemingly giving up any hope for a proper localization. In early 1997, a grim question is asked. Has Konami abandoned the Saturn? Even through this drama, the most shocking story about Parodius Deluxe Pack harkens back to that hidden text file in the Japanese release. Again, most of these are cute messages with some insight into development, but the paragraph from M. Mimitabi is different. It says, Lately, they've been thinking a lot about good luck versus bad luck. After a late night of arduous debugging, they overslept the next day, and missed the subway usually taken on the way to work. Mimitabi then says, if they hadn't slept in, they might have been killed by the sarin gas attacks. During morning rush hour on March 20th, 1995, a violent cult launched five sarin gas attacks throughout Tokyo's subway system. Thirteen people died, and thousands more were hurt. It's difficult to get exact numbers on who might have died from sarin-related complications years down the line, but several dozen were confirmed to be disabled by the attacks, and more than a thousand victims were certified as seriously hurt. Gokujo Parodius Da on Saturn came out in Japan on May 19th of 95, so given this time span, it would be reasonable to say this story is accurate. Context is often lost by machine translators, so I asked some fluent speakers who could verify if this is supposed to be taken seriously and not as some kind of sick joke. Fingers Malloy said it sounds serious. Talking about the thoughts on good luck versus bad luck, Mimitabi says, quote, For example, had I not overslept on the day I tried to do bug checks, I might have been done in by the sarin gas. Maybe sometimes when the enemy fire is coming down on you like rain and hail, and you don't know how or what you did, somehow you just managed to dodge it all. Bugs, the very theme of Parodius antagonists, might be what kept Mimitabi from the snarling jaws of death. Core video game fans want to finally see arcade games run perfectly at home, and Parodius is an early piece of evidence, the first gotcha to be rubbed in the noses of PlayStation simps. Clearly, fans are excited, and Mag Riders helped generate hype. Chairman Segata is also excited to see this on the horizon for Western Saturn loyals, but someone, some company exec somewhere, decided Parodius should not come out. It's not a next-gen 3D masterpiece, but it doesn't have to be. This light-hearted action game celebrating some of Konami's best work seems to always be in an uphill battle. Despite seemingly getting localized for the Americas and then abruptly getting cancelled, the franchise came to arcades at a time when its visitors began shutting out the genre in favor of fighters and 3D spectacles. You see, I don't think that the reason we're seeing less horizontal shooters these days is because the audience has shrunk. If anything, there's more fans of STG today than before. However, to be honest, I definitely feel like arcades today are becoming too dependent on a single genre. That was one of our goals with Gokujo Parodius, to bring some diversity to the kinds of arcade games being released so different fans can enjoy themselves. The feeling a person has when seeing a beautiful photograph and the feeling they have when seeing a beautiful picture are two different things. And I think as game designers working with pixel art, we're going to need to be more mindful of that distinction in the future. For STGs, for example, there's definitely a feeling that you need to make the sprites look really like actual metal. But more than that, I think you need to evoke that sense in the viewer of the individual artist's personality. So they go, oh, I wonder who made this. That's how I think pixel art will survive in the future. Parodius wound up with five shooters, all of which are playable on the Sega Saturn. Some weird turn-based strategy game called Paro Wars came out for PlayStation in 1997. After the 90s, the shooters were put out in a PSP compilation pack. Now, 
Parodius lives on in the ultimate afterlife for once beloved video game classics. Pachinko Machines. Think you can get it inside mine? <laughs> <laughs>